think Maura and Mariana will be here for um, some of the day. I know Maura is running a workshop, so you can grab them if you have more specific questions. But I hope um, Graduate Center students, especially as you um, begin to navigate your teaching on the campuses, you carry their research with you, you connect with your local librarians, always connect with the librarians. They know how to answer all the questions. Um, so thank you for that. Um, in Keith Catone's book, The Pedagogy of Teacher Activism, he profiled a Brooklyn High School social studies and history teacher who made it a habit to greet each of her students individually as they walked into the door for class, shaking their hands, looking them in the eyes, saying hi. She repeated the custom at the end of the class. On, the, on their way in, it had been a way for her to say to students, I recognize you, I see you, you see me, and to make an individual connection with them. On the way out, it was an opportunity to offer personalized words of encouragement, appreciation, correction, if necessary. That teacher, Natalia Ortiz, is now a doctoral candidate in urban education here at the Graduate Center. She serves as a Writing Across the Curriculum Fellow at LaGuardia Community College and teaches in the teacher education program at Hunter College. Her pedagogy, her pedagogy is directly related to her identity as an activist. She told Catone that in the end, what I'm trying to create in my classroom is an environment where my students feel empowered to do something different, to think differently, to love people, to question, not just to accept all the time. It's, if that's what I'm trying to produce in my classroom, then they're gonna become social agents of change, even if that means local, like in their families. If it means to challenge their parents, their mom, their brothers, their sisters, that's a start. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Natalia Ortiz. I'm short. Good morning. Hi. Woo. I shouldn't do that because people are probably like, ouch, live streaming. Um, so good morning, everyone. I am very, very happy to be here. I would like to thank um, Mora and Mariana for this presentation. That was awesome. And also thank all the people behind the scenes who are making today happen. Sometimes we don't acknowledge all those who do a lot of work. And so I'm bringing them into this space and saying thank you. Um, and a special thank you to Luke for inviting me to be one of this year's keynote speakers. Um, I'm so appreciative of this honor. So I'm gonna begin um, by telling you a little bit about me. I was born and raised in this beautiful city, New York, to a Chilean immigrant and a Puerto Rican father. My father immigrated to the United States after his father um, sorry, after his mother died at the age of four years old in the 1940s with his father, who ended up dying on the streets of Williamsburg due to alcoholism. My father made his life hustling, learning to work with his hands. He parked cars, did handyman jobs, and was a super in the Midtown building and ended up moving to Jacksonville, Florida, where he did paint jobs. My father passed away two years ago from lung cancer, and he taught me to always look for hope even when it seems like there is none. My mother, an immigrant from Chile, came to visit New York City and fell in love with my father and this city. She left her parents and six brothers and sisters to start a life here. She and my father got married and had us. I have a twin brother. When we began kindergarten, my mother started working in a Chilean copper company as a secretary and little by little began to learn English and become financially self-sufficient. At the age of seven, my mother decided to leave my father, who, like his father, struggled with a drinking addiction. She went on to do the best she could to raise us. Maria Cristina Gonzalez Belmar, I bring her name into this space. My mother is a survivor, a fighter, a warrior, and I am because she is. I am because he was. My first language was Spanish. An English language learner, and I attended public schools in Manhattan, and was fortunate to have received admission and a great financial package to attend Wesleyan University, a private liberal arts college in Middletown, Connecticut. It was there where I began to foster a love for history, and more importantly, my history, 
which seemed to be omitted in the public school education I had received. Side note, this is not something I blame teachers for, because I recognize that the one-story curriculum is forced onto teachers from higher-ups. So my professors challenged me to think and valued my perspective, something I wasn't really taught to do prior. I was always good at doing school. The homework, the tests, the responding to questions, the raising my hand. But I'm not sure that I was using my brain to construct my own opinion or to interact with the knowledge that was being given to me. Instead, I regurgitated the information, so to pass my exams and complete the papers. And it was in college that I was taught about resistance and the need for it in creating opportunity and equity. I was taught about the resilience and the power of indigenous communities, the intelligence and the brilliance of the Moors, the fight of women, and the courage of immigrant children. I witnessed a white male professor call out microaggressions enacted by white students and students of color. Professors asked us to analyze media for various messages that harm our communities, to think about how these messages can benefit some and disparage others. This kind of inquiry didn't only happen in the classroom, but happened in the living rooms and the kitchens of our dorms and or our senior houses. Sometimes, my friends and I would stay up till three in the morning, talking about religion, our families, our experiences with internalized oppression. We discussed philosophical questions around knowledge and truth. It was these experiences that taught me to become a thinker, a scholar, and most importantly, a change agent. And so, I made a commitment to myself to become a social studies teacher in New York City. I was dedicated to serving students like myself, students of color, immigrants, and working class students. I wanted to foster a learning culture, a space for inquiry, for community, for experiential knowledge, for skill building and analysis. I wanted to teach a history that I was never taught. And I remember thinking to myself, teachers of all levels, early childhood to higher education, should be teaching this to their students, or at least planting the seeds. How do we analyze our curriculum to ensure that it is representative of the students we serve? How do we make space in our classrooms to have students share their, her, his story? How do we share tools with our young people to foster critical thinking and questioning? These are some of the questions that I set out to answer. After Wesleyan, I went on to Harvard, where I completed my master's in education and in 2006 became a founding teacher at West Brooklyn Community High School, a transfer high school for overaged, undercredited students who later on went on to some of the CUNY schools like Kingsborough, Brooklyn College, BMCC. I taught United States history and a theater elective in addition to, be, in addition to being part of the instructional leadership team, the coordinator of student activities, and usually I was the only female to play in the student versus staff basketball games. I am passionate about teaching. Teaching is love. Teaching is resistance. Teaching is essential for social change. Even with the many confinements of our current educational system, there is space for radical love and for radical change. Teaching is a special craft, one that requires lots of care, practice, organization, and responsibility. All lessons and interactions must be thought through critically and with much self-reflection. It is important to be knowledgeable about the lives of your students and make space for their hearts and their minds. It is important to think about how one thinks about our students and how our, impact, our, our thinking impacts how we act. Therefore, we must question our own worlds of knowledge, challenge them, and sometimes relearn them alongside our students. Because of the love I have for our youth, and the love for learning, and the love and the hope that I have for our society, I decided to continue my graduate studies so that as a professor in education, a teacher of teachers, I could help nourish future teachers with the love and critical consciousness students deserve. So, this pretty much brings me to where we are today. I'm a fifth year graduate student 
here in the Urban Education Program. Currently, ABD, woo, <laughs> yes, yes please. <laughs> I started the program with my six-month-old daughter, Amaya, um, who is now five, and that was when she was like three or something. Um, and I defended my dissertation proposal nine months pregnant with my second child, Maceo, who is in that, I don't know if you can, you can't really see him, he's sleeping, in the carrier, um, who is now 20 mo 21 months old. Being a parent, a student, and a teacher has taught me to be more patient, compassionate, as well as structured and organized. It has also reminded me to constantly reflect Reflect on how to be a, a better parent. So, for example, I'll think, should I yell, talk stern, ignore? How to better teach? Should I give extensions, give choices for final assessments, revisit material that, that students seem lost in since it's most likely a reflection of my poor teaching? How to better learn? Should I read this article tonight or start fresh in the morning before the children wake up? Or while Maceo naps, should I write out some of my methodology or take a shower? <laughs> These are questions, right, that swirl in my mind, which cause me to reflect on the choices I make and the many possible impacts that each choice I make can have on my children, my students, my partner, my advisor, my academic journey. Sometimes we think that these roles, right, so mother, student, teacher, partner, are separate but in fact, they inform each other. My parenting impacts how I teach. My teaching impacts how I learn. And my teaching and learning impact how I parent, and not always in that order. The point is that I'm integrating these identities in my everyday thinking and interactions. So I ask all of you now in this space to take a minute. Think about all the roles you play. How do you manage them all? Do you have days where there's struggle? Do you have days where you just need a break? What keeps you going? I ask these questions because we, us in the space, and our students cannot remove our and their lived realities from their classroom selves which reminds me so much, and I'm so, like, the mapping, right? They're bringing that every day. I'm bringing that every day. You're bringing that every day into the same space. So pedagogy that centers a student's whole selves is what I ask of all of you today. We are whole people who share this space called CUNY, and we show up. Often, we center the teaching and learning, the content, the practices, the skills that our students must learn and receive. We don't think about the spaces we can create to actively invite the personal all the time and implement it into our teaching and learning. Can these coexist? Yes. There is this perception that to do the personal, we have to put aside the content and the skill, or that it has to be additional work but it's about fostering a holistic learning space that encompasses the critical care and the thinking and learning of our students. How do we do this? It's a good question. <laughs> and I know some of y'all are already doing this. You do it in your classrooms, in the spaces that you foster. You do it in your homes. And so, I'm, I know this is a keynote address and I'm supposed to do all the talking, but I'm actually gonna ask you all maybe, if please, and indulge me in this, um, to turn and talk to someone close to you. And think about the ways that you're already doing this in the space, in your spaces. Or think about ways that you can do this. Brainstorm. So I'll give you all about a minute, maybe 30 seconds, to do this. Do you need me to repeat the question? Yes, awesome. So how are we putting the personal and our whole selves into the work we're doing already? What spaces are we creating to foster our whole selves in the learning? Is that clear? Okay.
Awesome. Uh, so I hope that was fruitful. Um, are there some ideas that came up that we would like to lift up in the space? Yes, in the back. Sure. Would, did everyone hear that? Would anyone like to respond? Yes. Right. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if you were able to hear the response, but teaching is a way of being, and it's a holistic ex encounter is what I'm interpreting, and that we might be confined to this space, but every moment, every thought, every interaction, whether it be in the subway, with our children, with our partners, is a moment for teaching and learning. And so my, I, I think part of your question for me is, Sometimes what happens, right, I have the space because I teach social studies or history or the humanities to engage the personal that might feel different than in the STEM world or in business. But I think if we think about learning and we think about what our personal lives, our personal lives and our sharing of personal lives does not have to be, hey, y'all, I had a bad night, my child didn't sleep all night, and so I'm feeling a little, right? I think it's about where we make our connection to the learning, the spaces. So do we connect business or our experiences with business with our students. So what does it feel or look like to have them come in and do a do now on like, what are your thoughts around businesses? What businesses do you engage with on a day to day? What businesses do you not partake in, et cetera, right? Or things like that that engages their lived realities but also offers you the opportunity to share your experience as the professor to be like, well, this is my experience. Right? Um, thank you for doing this with me. There are some things that have worked for me, right? Um, around ways that I do this in my classroom or in, at CUNY with my students. And I just want to make clear that some of the things I'm about to talk about isn't necessarily like a one size fits all toolkit, right? Because we all know that learning, we are different people, and thinking and learning looks different for all of us. But it's about thinking and strategizing ways to bring the whole self into the learning. So as Luke mentioned before, the handshakes, right? That is something that I do and I really believe in. Um, and it is a way for me. And sometimes I wouldn't handshake. I would do an elbow or a fist bump or a head nod. Um, 
because I also understood that sometimes students didn't want to physically touch me, right? Some people had hand things, like sanitary reasons, which I get. But the whole point was for me to acknowledge them as they walked up into the space and they would acknowledge me. And it was an opportunity for, for me to make that connection. That said, I don't necessarily want all of you all, right, I'm not advocating for all of you all to start shaking hands and doing fist bumps and head nods as folks come in, but what opportunities do we have with our students to check in with the learning and to check out, right? Um, one of the things that I would do is free rights, kind of the example that I brought up just now. What does it mean to have them connect their lived experience with the material that we read, that we thought about, with the lecture that I'm about to give? Um, and also free rights to conclude the learning. So at the end of class, exit tickets, right? So that I get to get a glimpse of their thinking. What did they get? What do they still have questions about? What resonated for them? Why? Um, another thing is artifact sharing. What does it mean to bring a little piece of myself into the space? So find something in your home that has value and meaning. Bring it to our class and let's tell stories. Um, and I always feel that that automatically creates a, a learning environment where people trust each other and I'm not the only one doing the instructing. Like, they're talking to each other and building knowledge amongst each other. Um, so that's another activity that I would use. And at the end, as I say, always thinking about a closing circle or a reflection or a sharing, um, whether it's individually, in partnerships, or as a whole group. And depending on what gets said, I think it informs me the next day in how to approach my teaching, right? So I realize, oh, wait a second, a lot of folks had questions about this. So maybe it means that the next day I need to go in and start with that and then continue whatever was on my agenda for the content, right? So my time is definitely coming to a close. Um, and I just want to thank you all for listening to my story. It's a perspective, and, and that's what I can do, offer my perspective. I would like to end with some words that inspire me to continue this work. So when I was learning about my own Puerto Rican history, I, I learned about the Young Lords Party and saw Edis Morales' documentary called Palante, Palante, Siempre Palante, which means forward, always forward, which reminds me to keep going, to keep fighting together. It doesn't say parriba, siempre parriba, upwards, always upwards. It's saying forward. And you, me, us, and our students um, have to keep pushing forward. Palante. And in the words of June Jordan, who if you don't know who she is, maybe it's an opportunity to learn around about her writing, was born in Harlem, New York City. In her poem for South African women, she writes, we are the ones we've been waiting for. So I'm going to ask you all to repeat this with me. We are the ones, so call and response, let's try that again. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Again, we are the ones we've been waiting for. And now together, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Thank you, and I will end with this song. And have a good day, if it works. <laughs>
Okay, thank you to Mara, Mariana, and Natalia for centering us in this work for our conversations for the remainder of the day. Um, before we turn to the, the workshop portion of the program, I'd like to offer a few more um, notes of gratitude to individuals who've made this day possible. Um, first, to the staff of the Teaching and Learning Center, Elizabeth Alsop, Andy McKinney, Anka Geertzma, Avra Spector, Sakina Laksmi Moro, Mei Ling Chua. It's, it's a pleasure to come to work with you all every day. I'm inspired by your intellect, your warmth, your commitment to teaching. Thank you for being good colleagues and great partners in this work. Um, I'd also like to thank um, TLC Program Assistant Elizabeth Decker, who gave birth to a beautiful baby boy a couple weeks ago. Um, but before she left on maternity leave, she did much to set this day in motion. We're very lucky to have her. She left, left us lists and timelines and pre-printed handouts. And um, for the past week, I've been walking to her office hoping that she would be there to uh, help me focus, but she wasn't there. Um, but she texted me this morning. She sends all her, um, all her good wishes to you all. Um, a special thanks goes to Annabella Bernard from the Office of Career Planning and Professional Development, who's helped us tremendously um, while Elizabeth is on leave. Thanks to Matt Schoengood, the Graduate Center's uh, VP of Student Affairs, for supporting our work um, so strongly and so deeply. And thanks also to the uh, 20 or so CUNY colleagues who've agreed to facilitate the workshops for the remainder of the day. Um, uh, that none of the workshop facilitators this year facilitated workshops last year. So we have all new workshops, all new facilitators. Um, and that we can do that um, is testimony to just how many talented, committed educators there are at this university who are willing to share their experiences and knowledge about CUNY's classroom. So I'm very appreciative um, of their time, of their labor, and of their wisdom. A round of applause for facilitators. Unfortunately, two of the facilitators have wicked stomach bugs going through their homes um, currently, so two workshops have been canceled today. Um, one is uh, Jonas Reitz's um, workshop on uh, writing approaches in STEM courses. That's in workshop session one. Um, and the second workshop that we've canceled um, is Lisa Rohde's uh, workshop on approaches to digital pedagogy in workshop se session two. Um, all of the workshops will, will go on um, as planned. Um, uh, so we're actually right on time, so you can head to your workshop of, of choice. We'll have a workshop session, then we'll all have lunch together, um, and then the second set of workshops starts at, at 1.15. So thank you all for being here.